Hi, I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk, and this is Service Georgina, a show where we bring you information about the various departments and facilities within the town of Georgina. Joining me today to talk about bylaws and the billing department is Ryan Cronsbury, he's manager of uh, municipal law enforcement, and Rod Lommer, who's the manager of building and the chief building official. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting because the reason I wanted you both on together is a lot of times it, it's like a tag team with uh, some of the building issues and the bylaw issues, the enforcement side of, of some of the, uh, the uh, complaints that we get get tied in a lot with, uh, with the billing department. So I thought uh, the two of you together, we would uh, make a good uh, combination. And trust me, the most calls I, I've gotten as a councillor and a, as mayor have been probably from your department. So I thought it was important that we get some information out to, uh, to the residents. We'll go sort of back and forth, but we'll start off with, with you, Rod, and, and tell us a bit about uh, the building permit process. This is a great time of year that people start thinking about a pool or a, or a deck or what they're going to do uh, uh, outside of their home or even inside those, those winter projects. Tell us a bit about uh, the, the building permit process. Right, uh, we get quite a few people who, uh, who like to do their own renovations and build their own decks and, and that sort of thing. Um, they'll be ramping up to build their deck for the spring and getting thinking about their pools and that sort of thing. They, um, we, we receive a lot of designs from homeowners and we expect to, to, see, um, to, to see a certain amount of information on there, but uh, recognizing that some homeowners need some coaching through the process. Because sometimes it's the first time they've ever you know, put an application uh, in, so they can submit their own application, or does their contractor need to do it, or is it, does it depend on what the project is? Yeah, they can submit their own application, or they can have a, an authorized agent or their contractor do it for them. Uh, there's a, a couple of extra forms for that, but it's certainly possible for other people to represent the homeowner. Okay, so let's say I want to build a deck. What's my, my first step? What's my, the process? Uh, the first step with the first step with the deck is to find out um, what the limitations are to the deck, where it can be placed on the property, if there's certain setbacks to the property line, and because there's certain sort of sizes thing. and you can't get too close to property lines, so. How do I find that out? Do I come up to the town? Do I call? What, what, what can I do? Well, people can certainly take a look at our zoning bylaw, which is online. Um, and if they have any questions after that, they can certainly contact the building division, speak to a zoning examiner or an application examiner, and they'll help them through the process and explain some of the limitations and some of the, some of the um, processes behind obtaining a permit. Okay, so for a pool, for example, it might be a little bit more in depth. What sort of drawings or information do I, do I need to provide? With a pool, with, with most permit applications, a uh, site plan is almost always required. Uh, that shows the location of the project that's on the property, shows the setbacks to property lines and the distance to the house and that sort of thing. Um, with a, with specifically with a pool, we would be l really just looking for that site plan and some information on the actual enclosure that's being used, and I'll have to define what that would be. So, what if um, my setbacks aren't there? I'm, I want to be I'm, my pool or deck is going to be too close to uh, to the property line. Is there a process that they can? Go they through? can either move it, uh, which is the easiest process, or if they choose to uh, to if they if they wish to try to keep it in a location that doesn't comply with the zoning bylaw. Then and they may have an opportunity to apply to the planning division for planning approval. And what about like with pools, there's the, the pumps and the heaters, and sometimes those are, are noisy for, for neighbors. There's locations where those can be placed as well? They're also subject to setbacks, so yeah, yeah um, with, with neighbors in mind uh, and the noise and that sort of thing. So how long does it take to get a permit? And this is where sometimes I get feedback that, oh, it takes forever to get a permit. All I want to do is, is build a pool or put a deck up or, you know, how, so typically how long does it take? There's a number of steps that have to go through. Depends also if Lake Simcoe Regional Conservation Authority is involved and permits are required from them. Uh, typically, if you have all of the external approvals in place, uh, once you submit for the application, um, it will go through the zoning stream and it takes one to two weeks for that approval and then it moves on to the, uh, the building code stream. If it's a pool, it doesn't go on to a building code stream and it's, it's usually a little bit quicker. A little bit quicker and same for a, a shed. So we've talked about decks and pools, but certain size of sheds don't require permits, but a certain size does. Maybe explain the sort of right. difference. A, a shed that doesn't have plumbing and is less than 10 square meters in area doesn't require a building permit. It still has to comply with the zoning bylaw with respect to setbacks and the height of it, um, but it's, it's uh, exempt from the building code. Anything bigger than 10 square meters would require a, 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 building, a building permit. Permits. And you, like you say, you have to be 
cautious of uh, you know, where you are located and, and if you're in the Conservation Authority uh, regulated area, there's, there may be additional steps that you, you need, to, uh, need to do. That's right. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about one of my favorite departments, Certainly. bylaws. <laughs> And I laugh because, you know, <clears throat> we do correspond a, a lot because I do get a lot of uh, calls in. Um, what's your, uh, maybe explain some of the proactive things that we do and what sort of the, the biggest complaints that come in? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, proactively, uh, parking control is one bylaw that we do proactively enforce our streets for vehicles parked. And, and so why do we do that as opposed to not proactively uh, doing it? Them? It is a regulatory activity, so it is something that needs constant um, enforcement applied to it. It is something that ensures our streets are kept clear and that the rules are being followed all the time and without enforcement with um, proactive regulatory as in you can't park here at all. Um, if there's no enforcement then there's going it's going to occur. So that's something that needs proactive enforcement. It's not property related. Um, it is our streets. It's regulatory same uh, and similar to our parks right. bylaws. Um, you'll notice that bylaw officers are very um, proactive within our parks. They enforce permit parking mm -hmm. provisions at some of our pay and display parks. Mm -hmm. They also patrol the parks for things like our, our smoking bylaw, um, if there's any uh, legal burning, alcohol, right. those types of things. Because it's, it's ironic sometimes. I'll get a call or we'll get an email about a uh, complaint about parking. So you go out and do the enforcement and then we get complaints from those who receive the tickets. So it's it's a com it's a, a balancing act of, of needing to enforce the the bylaw. Um, and some areas are complaint driven as as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we, any time defenses. So if it's a three hour limit per se, uh, what happens with that is that is complaint driven. Officers because they all um, require two visits. Right. So you have to mark the vehicle and then you have to reattend th after three hours. So any time defenses are done complaint driven. Officers don't proactively enforce for that. Um, we will receive a complaint. Now it may be a complaint area for a period of time where officers will um, attend a few times to ensure uh, that the bylaw is being followed and right. to ensure compliance. So how many bylaw staff uh, do, uh, do we have? Yes, currently, um, so for the winter months and our standard full-time enforcement team is four um, full-time officers and we have one permanent part-time officer and we have two admin support staff in, within the bylaw division. So that's for everything, that's not just for, for parking, that's for property standards? That's for all the municipal bylaws, um, uh, property standards, zoning, as um, well as uh, licensing inspections. We license numerous businesses in town and activities, mm -hmm. um, including salvage yards or um, bed and breakfast, right, for example. Of... There's also um, a requirement for fireworks licensing, so they all get inspected. So uh, there is a, a high demand. Yeah. And in the summertime, though, we do hire additional, and in the winter, we do hire additional. Certainly, we had three seasonal staff for the summer, um, which help with our parks. They work strictly weekends, and that helps increase our uh, our presence in the parks to deal with the heavy um, beach loading that we end up getting at certain <laughs> times of the year. So that helps with that. So how many requests for service do we get? Each year. This year to date, we've had 2,400 um, uh, complaints, so 2,400 complaints to our department from the public, and those are requests for service, and that's in addition to any proactive work we do. Wow. So they're it, busy. Uh, they're busy. Um, things do sometimes take um, time to rectify, especially when you're dealing with people's properties. Right. Um, and there's always situations that take longer than others, and some are easy, easy dealings with. Our model enforcement is. Um, to educate, encourage, and then enforce. So we always look for compliance, but um, we do have a lot of requests from the public, and that's going to continue to grow. So between your two departments, um, there's times that you need to be able to enter a property for in inspections and stuff. So how does that? How do you two coordinate uh, that that ability to enter a property, and what what ability do we have to enter properties? We'll take. <clears throat> excuse me. We'll take um, uh, complaints from the public. Um, either one of our divisions or through Service Regina. And um, we'll coordinate quite often our, our efforts to, um, to investigate and uh, find out um, what exactly is, is happening. The concern, what would be the number one complaint that would come in in terms of is it, you know, my neighbor uh, is building something, I don't think he has a permit or, you know, 
what if if a call came in like that, what would you what would you typically do then? If uh, if it was construction without a permit, we would check our system first to see if there was in fact a building permit, and if not, we would um, we would uh, send out an inspector to investigate and, and try to contact the owner, investigate, find out what type of work it was being done, if any. Um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to do those investigations, um, whether it's a home or a commercial property. property yeah. type of thing. So how many uh, staff do you have as well? We'll get those numbers out there. Yeah. So. Uh, an applicant will be greeted by, by one of our two application examiners. We have two zoning examiners, um, one plans examiner, and we have a complement of five building inspectors who go out in the field and do the inspections and investigations. Okay, so what if um, uh, a resident calls in and says, uh, my neighbor has, uh, I think he has an apartment. It, how do we figure out if it's a legal accessory apartment and what's our right of, of uh, entry to check that out and what do they what can they do to make it legal if it isn't yeah so uh, I'll take that one Rod um, as far as uh, accessory apartments go um, to do an inspection you need to have grounds that a violation may exist so we don't um, attend properties just on random what happens is a lot of times we get a call to say that there's a lot of activity at a property whether cars there's parked, impact cars yeah. parked numerous vehicles on the road all the time cars over sidewalks and we'll get a call about that. Sometimes it could be a tenant that may call us um, with a concern about their unit. So um, that usually gives us our grounds to um, conduct an inspection. We do not have rights of entry into a dwelling unit without a warrant. So if we believe something is being used as a, as a, as a dwelling, we would need to obtain a warrant if lawful entry was not granted. So a lot of times the tenant will have us come in um, or the, the occupant of some sort or will arrange with the property owner. Apartments are permitted in many situations. Accessory apartments, they need to be registered at the town. And there is a process through our building division that Rod can touch on okay. where they can make application. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll, we'll talk about that because it's an important issue because a lot of people are concerned about uh, accessory apartments and can I mm -hmm. have them. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back uh, in just a couple minutes. Join us uh, when we can finish talking with uh, uh, Rod and uh, with Ryan. See, see you later. I'm talking today with Ryan Cronsbury, Manager of Municipal Law Enforcement, and Rod Larmer, who's our Chief Billing Official, and we've been learning about their two departments. And just before break, we were talking about accessory apartments, and we were learning about the registration process, and uh, um, I just wanted to get into where they can be in the, in the town and what happens if somebody has built an accessory apartment without the, the right permission. So let's talk about the, the registration first. Yeah, so all accessory apartments are required to be registered if um, they're within our town. Uh, if we become aware of an accessory apartment that isn't registered, bylaw officers will speak with the property owner. Um, should we uh, be unsuccessful in getting them to take steps to attempt to register it, we will then encourage, as I stated, mm -hmm. and it, by way of an order to just um, formalize the process and say please register your accessory apartment and that sends them to the building um, division at that point where hopefully the uh, property owner those that own the the premises will come into the town and and make an application to register their accessory apartment which also makes it safe for a fire department there's placards that go yeah, up. I have to go right on to the, the the house near the front or wherever that uh, that show that there's an accessory apartment that's right and that helps uh, fire crews identify that there is an accessory apartment in the building and it can save a loved one right. if needed exactly so going back to um, where can the accessory apartments go what should if someone wants to build one um, what should they do first well, the zoning bylaw is pretty complicated, so we encourage people to give us a call first to find out can they have an accessory apartment in their house. Um, and again, they're more than welcome to look at our zoning bylaw online uh, and then give us a call if they have other, other questions after that. Now, what if they have an accessory apartment? They've purchased a home that had an accessory apartment or they've 
built one and then somebody says, hey, you know what, I don't know if you can have that. Can they legalize an apartment afterwards? Let's assume that it's in an area that they can have mm -hmm. an apartment. How would they go about legalizing it? Uh, it's similar to the other permit processes. Uh, we work with those people. We want to try to encourage them to comply. Um, they'll need to submit some plans, a site plan and a floor plan showing the layout of the of the suite. Right. Um, we review fire safety items like egress, exits, fire uh, doors, fire doors, right. yeah, all the separations that are required. There's some heating work that has to happen. So there's quite a bit of work that, that has to happen to make it safe. Mm -hmm. um, smoke alarms are, are a, a big, big priority. Yep. Absolutely. CO2 detectors, yes. all those sorts of things. And it's, you know, it's something that needs to be done from a from a safety point of view. And I know some people maybe don't like to go through the, the permit process. Um, they feel it's cumbersome, it's, it's expensive. But it can be more expensive in the in the long run, especially if you're, something happens from a, a legal point of view. If you haven't had the right inspections done, there's uh, certainly if it's not legal, uh, somebody could be uh, accountable to right. um, to other authorities. Uh, we work together with bylaw and also with fire, um, depending on the age of the of the suites. Um, there's there's uh, a lot of processes, a lot of things that happen in the background that we all do to help the person, help the through, person the through the process to yeah. get their permit. That's right. So let's say I'm, I'm driving through town, I see a home that I feel is in dangerous condition, and is there emergency situations? Who do I contact? Do I give your office a call, and what would you do if you went out to inspect? Certainly, if somebody felt that a building was unsafe, uh, they can give the building division a call or service to Regina. We will. Um, we want to sort of vet through the process as well and, and find out what the issue is. Uh, sometimes it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, if we confirm that there's uh, something that we need to investigate, then a, an inspector uh, will, will come out, will come out as, as soon as we can get there. Yeah, I know sometimes it says a result of an emergency situation. I'm thinking recently uh, there was a traffic accident involving a vehicle that went through a, a building. I believe uh, building department staff went out to inspect to see the condition of of that structure. So those are the types of things as well that you would get involved with. Yeah, just something like that. We typically get a, a phone call right away from the fire department while they're still on scene mm -hmm. and we try to get out there while they are on scene, meet the owner who's almost always there by that time as well and try to help them through the process, let them know what they need to do moving forward. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite a traumatic time for them obviously. Oh yeah, obviously if it's so, been a fire or, or a structure right. damage of, of some way, shape or form. So going back to the inspections, what sort of inspections do I need and how do I get those out at the right time? There are a number of inspections over the course of the construction depending on the what type of work that's right. happening. Um, they're all prescribed by the building code. On the back of the permit placard that gets issued, um, there's a list of the inspections that we, uh, we need to be notified of. And um, it can range anywhere from the footings if you're building new to framing insulation, eventually occupancy it's also requires a permit, so we need to do an inspection. Right, so at what point can I occupy? If I'm having a, a house built for me or I'm building it myself, at what point can I occupy that home? I've sold my other house and now I need to move in. When can I move in? So again, the building code prescribes exactly what needs to be done in order to occupy a building, and, and typically we're looking at the safety things, guardrails, handrails, smoke alarms, CO detectors, uh, any fire separations where they're required. We want to make sure that all of the inspections before that have been done and passed, and, um, and, and that sort of thing. So how do I book an inspection? Do I call? Do I get on a waiting list? What if I, because sometimes it's timing, I need to have this inspected before that can occur, so how do they make contact? Well, if a homeowner or a contractor gives, a, gives us a call before 8.30 in the morning, um, we try to do the inspection that same day. Um, they can contact us through the website, um, which is a, an ideal form because it lists all the actual inspections, so right. they can check off the inspection and add a note if they have a special note, like a phone number. They can give us a phone call on the inspection line, or they can drop us an email at building at georgina.ca. Because I know I went out with uh, Devin a couple years ago on uh, his, his inspections and it is interesting to see you know, what they do look for, um, what the, the builder is, is wanting to have done and it, it is that time and I know that the staff do try to work with and coordinate those times because there's certain things you can't do until you've had you know, an, an inspection done. So, um, And I know we're, we're going through a, a service delivery review as well so I'll touch on that in a little bit but I, I want to talk to Ryan again about um, we're in the winter season right now, and, and when snow falls, sometimes we have to do um, 
snow plowing and we have a, a new thing called the, the winter maintenance event and maybe you can step us through what that is and how that works in the town. Yes, certainly. So we always had a 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, no prohibition from parking on any street between November 15th and April 15th. Except for um, a couple areas. Except for a couple areas in Simcoe Landing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's right. There are some areas there where it's alternate side parking right. and there's a switch over time at 9 a.m. Right. Uh, we also, what we came quick to realize is that it doesn't only snow overnight, that it does <laughs> snow it snows during the during day. The day. Yeah. And uh, what we do is to facilitate um, parking operations. Um, our operations team determined that there was not a large concern on a lot of streets with parking on it as long as during a big substantial snowstorm during the day we had them off the, the, off the street. So a winter maintenance event could be declared at any time um, that there is snowfall or icing operations. Mm -hmm. Um, by the director of um, operations or a designate and at that time what we'll do is utilize our communications team as, and uh, push out the media release to our local news um, and radio stations, social media, social media Twitter, right. they'll be on our uh, display signs at the Ice Palace as well as at the end of Civic Centre Road. So at that time we're telling people to remove their vehicle from the streets so we can facilitate snow removal right. and it does just ensure that the snow plows can get through the streets they don't have to come back and that the roads are cleared as far as they can to the curb type thing just so the streets I've, don't close in. I've gone in, uh, gone out with the snow plow guys as well and, and uh, in the trucks if they're trying to maneuver around uh, the cars they're not able to clean everything and then if we get freezing rain or if it uh, suddenly gets cold and you get that, that hard ice build up of, of that snow and then the car moves you've got these chunks of, of, uh, of, of hard snow so certainly I think snow plowing is something that you probably have to experience driving one of those large machines and cleaning the streets to really appreciate the work that oh they yeah are. and I they think you do, do a great job and this will help that and it does help the neighborhood as well so mm -hmm. um, it, it won't happen very often but when it does we, we're trying to get the word out to the public to be aware of that and be off the street eventually tickets will be able to be issued for that what we're trying to do in the in the beginning is just encourage and, as I said, and get the vehicles off the street, street during a winter yeah. maintenance event. And sometimes it can last for a couple of days, that, that maintenance event. So, That's right. Yeah. Now, something we went through uh, and spent a lot of time on the last couple of years was a leisure vehicle and yes. the, uh, the, the storage. And maybe sort of quickly uh, tell people where they can get the information. And I know it, it depends on where you are. So Yes, uh, it is. It's it can be um, very complicated for people at, at first, but it does give greater permissions to people to um, have leisure vehicles on their property in their driveway. Um, there is a seasonal provision for a lot up to a certain size, um, where between, uh, I believe it's April 1st to October 31st, um, you'll be able to keep your leisure vehicle in your driveway if you meet the required setbacks. Right. All that information can be um, gathered from our website. We also have a, a guide at our libraries that's available to educate um, property owners on where they can be. There's permanent storage is allowed on a bigger lot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you won't see it in a lot of subdivisions, a permanent right. storage. Because it depends on the size of your lot and, and if, how function. many vehicles, you know, because one of the concerns is once you allow a, a leisure vehicle to be stored right. on a driveway, where do the cars go That's that, right. that we're parking in that driveway? Because we know a lot of times people's garages aren't big enough for their vehicle or they're storing other things uh, in there. Absolutely, and there was multiple departments involved in that at the oh, town. Yeah. Um, we had planning consultants involved in doing the study. We also had our operations team and planning and, and myself from enforcement. And we uh, know that we need to monitor the streets to see if there is spillover from that. And staff are continuing to monitor the success of that bylaw. But so far to date, um, I mean, in the winter months, we've noticed a lot less are on the properties. But yes, they were there during the summer, summer months, months yeah. and um, being used. Because I know in, in the past, people thought uh, we were um, changing it and making it more restrictive. It was never allowed in, in, the, in the past. You couldn't park your leisure vehicle in your driveway. And we weren't talking about letting people park on their grass area. This was um, on, on the driveway portion. Yeah, um, prior to this bylaw, it was illegal um, since, I believe, 1976, in the 70s. I'm yeah. going to say close to that. Um, to keep any leisure vehicle in the front yard. Uh, it had to be stored in your interior side yard or rear yard. So in a lot of areas with small boats, with Lake Simcoe, there were a lot of residents that have boats um, yeah. in the municipality and as well as camping. So this has allowed some feasibility in the residents 
um, there was a large ask for a little bit of flexibility. Yeah, so it, it took a while to go through the process, but uh, it looks like it's working and it, it, it help, has, has helped some, uh, some people. Um, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to touch base. You had mentioned about uh, some new requirements for um, the uh, building code coming up in, that have happened this month. One of the big things is, uh, is with climate change, um, it's, uh, the, the ministry has implemented some amendments uh, that res with respect to electric vehicle charging. So new permits uh, that are coming in now need to um, actually accommodate for electrical electric vehicle oh, charging good. stations in houses. That's good to Roughed know. in, uh, 200 amp panels, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's some interesting Good changes happening. Good to know. Well, uh, thank you very much. It was a great learning experience. I'm sure uh, people picked up a few tidbits. Um, this has been uh, Service Georgina. I'm, I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk, and uh, I want to thank Rod and, and Ryan for, for joining me. Um, we'll see you next time. We've got all kinds of other departments to, uh, to talk to. So uh, come back uh, next week and see what we're talking about. See you then.